Hello, I'm Dr. Jean Preuss. In this video, we'll look at the Movimiento, the Mexican-American Chicano movement from the 1960s to the 1970s. We'll look at the status of the Mexican-American community following World War II, the effects of the Cold War on Mexican-Americans, and the effects of the Civil Rights Movement on the Chicano movement. In the 1960s, we see a change in the Mexican-American community in the United States, one that becomes more numerous, more urban, and younger. So we see almost 4 million people, most of them are living in the Southwest, between California and Texas, and they are mostly urban. We're not talking about a rural population, but 80% of them are living in cities like Los Angeles, San Antonio, San Francisco, and El Paso. Most of them were American-born, and it was a young population. In terms of social mobility, we see more legal immigration coming in from Mexico. Now, there was a great amount of illegal immigration as well. But we see fewer people classifying themselves as laborers, working in menial labor positions. You also see more women working outside of the home. Better education. More people were completing high school. Some were going on to community colleges and junior colleges. And there were increased concerns in traditional areas like housing. There were still many, many more miles to go as far as education was concerned. And there was still the fact that although they were earning more money, they were not earning as much as their white counterparts. In the Cold War, as it continued in two areas, especially in Korea and Vietnam, Mexican-Americans served disproportionately to their numbers. Some uh, 165,000 Hispanics served in Korea. What stands out is the 65th Infantry Regiment, which was mostly Puerto Rican, the Boricaneers. They were attached to the 3rd Infantry Division, and they earned many distinguished uh, medals of validation. And you see the picture here of Lieutenant Richard Cavazos. He is from Kingsville, Texas. He's going to be uh, one of the commanders in the unit, and he is going to go on to become America's first Hispanic four-star general. In Vietnam, you had a lot of Hispanics that are serving as well, and we can look at the reason why that they were kind of overrepresented. That we see that in the draft boards, there were very few, if any, Mexican-Americans serving on the draft boards, and that the uh, ability to get earn deferments for military service was pretty low. A lot of them were ineligible for deferments if they had been uh, had a criminal record, if they were high school dropouts, if they weren't enrolled in college, then they were eligible for the draft. And so uh, you do have a higher percentage that serve there as well. Many older Americans are going to support Usually the Democratic Party, LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and Vietnam, and were mostly Texas-based. The This is like LULAC and American GI Forum. However, we're going to see this rise of younger Mexican-Americans who are opposed to all three of these. They're opposed to the Democratic Party. They're opposed to Johnson and Vietnam. And it has more of a California element to it. There was a lot of anti-imperialism as well. Many young people felt, why are we going over? They were asking themselves, why are we going over and fighting a war for imperialism when we ourselves were victims of it at home? And they also were looking at the number of deaths of Hispanic surnamed uh, victims of Vietnam. Then you see the rise of the term Chicano in the mid to late 1960s. Now, what is this? term come from. There's a lot of debate, and a lot of different people have different origins, uh, that it may have been an uh, early Aztec name for Mexico, or that it could have been uh, a slang term popular in the barrios of uh, California, East Los Angeles, that gained popularity. Uh, for many people, it was a term of derision. And so the young people took that term on as a source of pride. 
and they define this meaning that a Chicano is a Mexican American with a non Anglo image of himself, according to Ruben Salazar, a newspaper reporter looking into the Chicano movement. And the Movimiento, the movement, the Chicano movement, is inspired by the civil rights movement uh, that African Americans were uh, doing in the 1960s, fighting for their civil rights, young people uh, protesting, facing police brutality. Uh, and harassment in order to draw attention to segregation and discrimination. They were also inspired and uh, influenced a bit by the Great Society itself. Although they were against Lyndon Johnson, uh, the Great Society programs did allow economic opportunities to improve in some of the areas and also gave them an opportunity to find positions of leadership by serving in some of these organizations. Let's look at a few of the leaders, uh, or at least the icons, of the Chicano movement. One was, of course, Cesar Chavez, uh, and we look at the United Farm Workers strikes in the 1960s. What had happened was the Bracero Agreement had ended in 1964, and so while you don't have the number of Mexican temporary workers coming to the United States, you do have more and more illegal immigrants coming in. Unions were attempting also to recruit Mexican-American workers, and Cesar Chavez built upon this, and he and Dolores Huerta, who was uh, kind of his right-hand person in this, they helped organize the Delano strikes in 1965, especially against grapes, so the grape pickers strike of 1965 to 1970s. They also helped to change the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, it had been established in 1967, uh, among the Ohio farm workers to include more Mexican Americans and to reach out, uh, especially from Ernesto Galarza, to reach out to more Mexican Americans. California, as a result, did relent to passing the Agricultural Labor Relations Act in 1975, which allowed collective bargaining, which strengthened unions and their positions for farm workers. And part of this was because of the violence between Teamsters, the Teamsters Union, who was also trying to organize farm workers and United Farm Workers. In 1975, there was a march from San Francisco to Modesto, California, uh, and this showed support for UFW, United Farm Workers, which allowed the California legislature to pass legislation protecting and recognizing the right uh, farm workers to organize. In New Mexico, Reyes Lopez Tijerina advocated a position uh, of reclaiming the lost land. He started calling attention to what had happened following the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in the 1850s and from then on that uh, the Hispanics were losing their land sometimes by hook and crook. Now, he was a Protestant Pentecostal minister, but he got involved in this. Uh, he was kind of looking to build his own community in the desert. Uh, he did some occupations and some attacks on people. Is charged with criminal activity and remains at large uh, hiding out from the law for several years. His organization, the Alanzia Federal uh, de Mercedes, organized the heirs of these Spanish land grants and they also undertook a march themselves from Albuquerque to Santa Fe in eight, 1966. Uh, they later on occupied Echo Amphitheater Park there. Uh, and then it was the raid on the Tierra Amarilla Courthouse uh, that uh, where some security officers and, and deputies were injured uh, that led to his imprisonment in 1970. Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez was a boxer who uh, became a poet and a writer. He organized the Crusade for Justice in 1966, and his famous poem, Yo Soy Joaquin, in 1967, kind of became the spiritual origins of the Chicano movement. He organized the first National Chicano Liberation Youth Conference in 1969, which led to the spiritual plan of Atzlan, which kind of gave some organization to the Chicano movement and to what Chicanos were seeking to address. There were groups like the Brown Berets. These were a high school group initially in 1966, Young Chicanos for Community Action in East Los Angeles. They were looking to address urban youth concerns. Uh, they began organizing what they know, what were known as blowouts. Uh, we might call them walkouts uh, from the California schools to protest the lack of Chicano studies and history 
in school. Sal Castro was a teacher who helped organize and uh, represent the students. And they started an organization called Mecha, Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Atzlan, uh, the Chicano Students Movement of Atzlan, which sought to increase the number of Mexican-American teachers, which sought to bring Mexican-American studies into the classroom. They organized the Chicano Anti-War Moratorium. Uh, these were a series of marches and demonstrations against the Vietnam War. Uh, there was one in August of 1970, uh, and in this one, Ruben Salazar and a couple of others were killed. Now, they were seen as a militant group, even though that wasn't necessarily uh, their intention, but they did build upon that image. Jose Angel Gutierrez uh, was from South Texas, town of Crystal City, and he started an organization in 1967 as he was going to college called the Mexican American Youth Organization, or MAYO. And Jose Angel Gutierrez was called back to help out when, in 1969, high schoolers at Crystal City began organizing their own walkouts from December to January over the winter holidays. This went on for several weeks, and the students were asking, much like they were in California, about more teachers, better representation. One of the problems that helped start this was that uh, Hispanic girls were denied the opportunity to, be, to serve as cheerleaders on the school for the school team and for the school representation. Uh, and so this started it, and it later on moved into uh, concerns about not enough Mexican-Americans uh, on the school board, or not any, really, uh, or on the city council. And uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez helped organize this and helped to uh, bring attention to this, uh, the various walkouts that were going on in that area as well. In 1969, in Mission, Texas, in South Texas, they organized the Mayo Conference. And at this, uh, they formed an organization called La Raza Unida Party. And this was a political movement. Uh, and there, the candidates from La Raza Unida began running. Uh, and in Crystal City and others, they began seating more Mexican Americans on city councils. He was later on elected to the national chair of. The La Raza Unida Party in 1972. In 1966, the Albuquerque walkout occurred. This was a meeting in Albuquerque, New Mexico, of the Equal, Oppor Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, and what had happened was the delegates said there's not any Mexican Americans on the Board of Commissioners. So they demanded a White House conference. Later on, the White House uh, did have a planning meeting in El Paso, uh, and this led to a cabinet-level meeting or hearings on Mexican-American affairs. It was chaired by Vicente Jimenez, also from South Texas, uh, who was a friend and a supporter of Lyndon Johnson's, and he became chair uh, of LBJ's Interagency Committee on Mexican-American Affairs. This was made up of cabinet members in Johnson's uh, uh, White House, uh, and they held this meeting in El Paso to coincide with the signing of the Chamazal Treaty. The Chamazal Treaty, uh, there had been a historic dispute because the Rio Grande River changes course from time to time uh, that oftentimes favors either the United States or Mexico. And this was a treaty that uh, President Johnson and the President of Mexico met in 67 to sign to give Mexico the land and recognize that territory as Mexico. Barraza Unida protested the El Paso meeting, and they had a follow-up meeting in March in 1968 in San Antonio to express their discontent. There were continued efforts on the part of the Mexican-American generation, the older generation. They didn't disappear. Uh, some of those milestones that we see, in 1954, the first Supreme Court case to address the concerns of Mexican-Americans in Hernandez versus Texas. This was over representation on juries. Uh, President John F. Kennedy and his entourage, including LBJ uh, and uh, Jackie Kennedy and Mrs. Johnson, Governor John Connolly, uh, came to Houston, Texas uh, on a trip around Texas on November 21st, they arrived at Houston at the Rice Hotel, 1963. That was the night before he was assassinated in Dallas. And this is a picture of them at the Rice Hotel meeting with LULAC at a LULAC event. LULAC also helped form SER, 
that's service, employment, and redevelopment, jobs for progress. This was in a job placement uh, service formed here in Houston and later on spread throughout the United States. Uh, and in 1968, of course, the Fair Housing Act, Lyndon Johnson signed to eliminate discrimination in housing practices and what were known as uh, restrictive covenants. And these were sometimes when people would sell property, they would place a covenant saying that this property could never be sold to uh, Mexican-Americans or African-Americans. And this made those covenants illegal. They also fought uh, continued battles against educational segregation. Of course, there's the Mendes decision in California in 1946, and then the Companion decision in Texas, Delgado versus Bastrop in 1948. And these are at the federal level. And what the concern was, was that young Mexican-American children were not speaking English. And so the school said they needed to be segregated uh, into Spanish-speaking classes. So Lulike helped organize the Little Schools of the 400 movement. This started in Ganado, Texas. It was supported by Houston Lulike. Later on, the state of Texas uh, started funding the program. Eventually, it became one of the inspirations for the 1965 Project Head Start that the federal government developed. In 1957, you also see the educational case against discrimination, uh, Hernandez versus Driscoll Consolidated Schools, uh, and this did not still address the problem of segregating uh, children uh, in schools. Finally, in Cisneros versus Corpus Christi in 1970, Supreme Court extended the Brown decision that separate uh, was not equal to include Mexican-American children in schools. In 1971, the next year, the Supreme Court in the case Rodriguez versus San Antonio Independent School District, uh, 1971, uh, laid the groundwork uh, for whether or not education was a constitutional right. Unfortunately for LULAC and the Mexican-American community, the Supreme Court said the Constitution didn't guarantee the rights uh, of education, but it laid the groundwork for further fighting for desegregation of schools. And this was more for economic segregation and economic um, inequality. Other in events inspired by the Chicano movement of the 60s and 70s, uh, the Starr County strike. Uh, this uh, happened in 1966 over the summer. And there's a picture of it here where farm workers from far south Texas uh, marched from South Texas all the way up to Austin in hopes of meeting with the governor to bring attention to low wages that farmers earned. Uh, ultimately, the governor did not meet with him on Austin. He refused to. Instead, he came down to uh, just outside New Braunfels, Texas, uh, and met with the marchers there. They continued, however, on into Austin, about 10,000 of them uh, marching uh, on Austin Capitol grounds. The development of the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, or MALDEF, began in San Antonio in 1967. Uh, this was done as a joint result of LULAC, GI Forum, and NAACP. Uh, this kind of an interracial uh, and interorganizational uh, effort to put more emphasis on legal concerns and on fighting court fights uh, against discrimination. Then there was the development of the National Council of La Raza. This was 1968. Uh, Julian Zamora, Herman Gallegos, Ernesto Galarza, uh, together with uh, inspiration from the Ford Foundation. How does the Ford Foundation reach out and help Mexican Americans more effectively? Uh, this was a they, they were hired to promote this in the 1960s, and then finally they found a uh, National Council of La Raza a few years later in Phoenix, Arizona. The National Council of La Raza uh, kind of serves as a organizing an umbrella organization to help draw together various groups and activities to focus on the concerns of Mexican-American community. In 1968, uh, the federal government instituted the Bilingual Education Act, and this uh, was for Department of Education funding for school districts to implement bilingual education programs in their schools. And there's been a lot of back and forth over that. But it starts in the late 1960s, uh, where the schools start funding these types of programs. 
1969 in Austin, Texas, the Economy Furniture Strike. This was a strike uh, by workers at the Economy Furniture Plant. The Economy Furniture Plant produced furniture for a lot of retail stores. Uh, and this strike over low wages and refusal to recognize the union went on for a couple of years uh, until the furniture company finally did agree to work with the unions. So in looking at these events and changes that took place, if we estimate the status of the Mexican-American community following World War II, an increase in Mexican immigration caused the Mexican-American community to grow and also to spread across the United States and allowed for some noticeable economic and legal improvement. The Cold War showed that patriotism and the means to get out of poverty led many Mexican-Americans to serve in the military in places like Korea and Vietnam and gave them an opportunity for some recognition for their service. And finally, the effects of the civil rights movement on the Chicano Movimiento is that young people seeing the stronger community that they were building and an opportunity to advance their own political and economic strength sought to kind of mold themselves around some of the things that the civil rights movement itself were doing, sit-ins, uh, walkouts, and other types of demonstration to bring attention to their own concerns. And this, of course, was fueled because they were young, part of the youth movement following the baby boom. Thank you very much for watching.